welcome. We, we, we ain't afraid of no ghosts. This is your number one podcast for ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties. Bringing you everything you need to know about things that go bump in the night and interviewing the personalities behind them. Make sure your doors and windows are locked. Now, here are your hosts, your ghost hosts, Scott and Julie. Hello and welcome to The Paranormal Project. My name is Scott Allen. I am here with my lovely co-host, Julie Finn. Our guest today is one of the most visible and prolific researchers of folklore and legends today. A natural storyteller, he is the award-winning Emmy-nominated host, writer, and producer of the New England Legends series on PBS and Amazon Prime, and is the author of over a dozen books published in six languages, and also hosts the New England Legends weekly podcast, which has garnered over three million downloads since it was launched. Please welcome to the show, Jeff Bellinger. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much for being here. Hello, Scott and Julie. Good to see you guys again. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we were with you last night. night. Yes. Natick Natick Town Hall in Natick, Massachusetts. So if you get a chance to see Jeff, you are on the road. What do you have coming up next? Is there anything, uh, if people are looking to connect with you, I know they can be on your website. Yeah. So, I mean, I've I've got, uh, I mean, I've still got another 40 or 50 programs booked between now and the end of the year, most of them in the fall. And my website's got the listing, all of them. Some of them are virtual. Uh, many of them are free. Some are at conferences. But my favorite thing in the world to do is to uh, not only research stories of the strange, the unusual, and the paranormal, but to share them. Because I think that's that's the point. Uh, because frankly, the only reason I ever hear about a place being haunted or, or having strange goings on is because people talk. And it gets around. And eventually it gets to me. And so I love the sort of community thing that happens when we share these stories. Well, and you know, I like how you, you know, we sat down and you had the, obviously, as you said, we could not light a campfire in the middle of the library, but, but it was that kind of a feel, you know, you have the campfire, you're telling the ghost story and you are, you have a great way with storytelling and being able to share your experiences, which was, which was really nice. And, and I got home last night and I turned on, like I said, it's my favorite thing. I, I, I turned on the New England Legends last night, and 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 there you were with the with the water and the and one of the other ones. I just saw this about forty five <laughs> minutes ago. So there you go. <laughs> this yeah. show is actually airing. It's it's pre recorded, but it's airing on July fourth. It's our Independence Day show. Um, unless you're you know our friends in England who probably what they call it Trader Day. I think is that what they call it over in, over in the UK. That's what, sure. I was, that's what I was told by my daughter's friend's husband who grew up in England. And right. my what I said to him was, well, you know, you're not a traitor if you win the battle. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Hey, you know what? Try to tax our tea again. That's all I have to say to our British right. friends. There you go. <laughs> we won't have it. You know, I was really interested in your book. Now, I know it's 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 a book for young people. Mm-hmm. The book, um, Who's Haunting the White House? But I'm really interested in your, because you got into the White House. I mean, you were in the White House. You got access to the White House. You did what you needed to do. Was was Obama president at the time? Is that is that the president when you were able to get through? It was actually George W. Bush, the oh, second George Bush. W. Bush. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. He was in his final year of office. Yeah. Uh, however, I should say that the, the the Bush administration had nothing to do with it. Um, I, I it's it all started years earlier. It started back in two thousand three, when uh, I wrote my first book, The World's Most Haunted Places, and the White House was a chapter in that book. And I was like, holy! I mean, there's so much here. I, I, chapter's not enough. And I never stopped thinking about it. And so I proposed the idea to a publisher. I said, hey, I want to do a book about the ghost of the White House for young people, because I feel like you can't know who a ghost is unless you know who a ghost was, a person was. And it's kind of an innovative way to, to sort of learn history. And she thought it was a great idea. And so they said, well, you know, well, the White House lets you in. Can you get cooperation? And so I called the main number on the switchboard. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, no. I, I don't know if you have a better place to start. I did not at the time. No. And so I called and I said, hey, hello, White House. 
Uh, so I'm interested in writing a book about here. The, yeah, right. Yeah, taxpayer, you know, part owner of the building you work in. Um, actually, for all I know, the switchboard isn't even in that building. I wouldn't be surprised. Who knows? But, um, so I said, hey, I want to write a book about the ghost of the White House. And, and I was hoping to speak to someone about like doing some interviews and things like that. And the, the operator went, hmm, uh, hold on a second. Okay. <laughs> and within a few seconds, I'm transferred. And suddenly I'm on the phone with the boss. It was amazing. And yeah. and the boss, by the way, before you go thinking is the president, it is not. The the, the right. person who runs the White House is the <laughs> chief usher. And okay. the chief usher, uh, his name was um, uh, Gary Walters uh, at the time. He, I think he'd only been, oh my gosh, something like the, the 20th uh, ever, right? Or, or no, less than that. It was like the 17th person to ever hold the position. And Gary Walters had served every president since Nixon. All the way through George wow. W. Bush. Wow. So this is a guy who spent more time in the White House than even a two-term president, right? right. I mean, if, if you're there for eight years, you're going to take trips. You're not going to be there every night. If you're there 40 to 60 hours a week for decades, right, it's going to add up. Yes. So I said, hey, I want to write a book about the ghost of the White House. And he said, no, we're not interested. And I said, well, look, I think we can use this as a way to teach you know history to kids. And he said, go on. And so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we arranged a meeting. Um, I, I had to get some help from my elected officials um, who yeah. pulled some favors. There was a background check done and so on. Sure. And I got to go down to the White House. And uh, the first thing I did was I got to take the tour that um, anybody can still take, by the way. It's it's you just have to sign up pretty far in advance right? Uh, and you get an appointment now. But I took the tour and then I got to speak to some of the, the staff, including Gary Walters. And it's so amazing. Have, have you ever been to the White House? I've never been in. I've, I've been, been outside, in. you know. Outside. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> but that's it. <laughs> There's some inherent power in that building. Um, it's famous, right? And and I guess I know we're all um, uh, starstruck. We're all we're all prone to celebrity worship. For me, I, I sort of grew up around some celebrities, so I've never been too enamored with people per se. Not to say I don't have my you know fanboy moments, sure. but um, but for the most part, I don't get freaked out standing around people who are famous. I do get freaked out being around famous locations, right? So when I'm like, whoa, the white, right? Like I get geeked about right. the buildings. Yeah, yeah. And so when you stand there and you realize every single U.S. president stood where you're standing. Um, and I know George Washington died before it was complete, but he laid the cornerstone. He was there. He was on the ground, right? right? All right. of them stood right where you're standing when you're out there by the North Portico. And there's this inherent power and gravitas to the building. And that, to me, is just the start of it, because I think a lot of the ghost experience has to do with going into a place and putting your 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 psyche into the, the location, its history and everything that took place that left a mark in that building. I mean, the world is what it is today because of decisions made inside of that building. You know, like, uh, borders are drawn in certain places. Treaties were made uh, on and on. And it's a powerful place. And as I'm going through the White House and I'm looking at, you know, the paintings of Lincoln and, and all these other, you know, artifacts, some, some of the, a desk that was used by presidents who've been dead for 150 wow. years now and, and so on. Um, there was Secret Service agents in each room of the, the White House on the main floor. And they knew everything about the, the building and the, the, the furniture and the painting on the wall and who painted it and where the frame came from, like everything. Wow. And I said to one of them, I said, well, what do you know about the ghost of the White House? He said, well, people talk about a British Redcoats ghost seen out near the North Portico. And uh, of course, there's the Lincoln bedroom and President Lincoln. And I went, wow, you said that in the same tone of voice that you talked about the rug and the desk and the frame. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, didn't miss a beat, not one thing like, well, whatever. And I'm like, is this federal recognition of the existence of ghosts? And he's like, sir, I don't know what you're talking about. And uh, <laughs> he's got a gun, so I didn't really press the matter. Right. But yeah. um, but he I was could kill I was you with a paper clip. Yeah. 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 Right. Like, yeah, he could, yeah, he could kill me with a death stare. It was amazing. <laughs> uh, sure. but just matter of fact about it. And I'm like, I love that. I love that we could be matter of fact about it. Yes, this house has that reputation. And it just started me down a long rabbit hole of research. So it was all research. You weren't in there with a spirit box and a voice recorder trying to pick up, you know, uh, hey, hey, Lincoln's wife to see if she was having messages for you. I assure you, had I pulled one of those out, I would have been tackled and we probably wouldn't probably. Even be talking right now. You would right. never heard me again. Um, in fact, so so the Secret Service, some woman pulled out a cell phone. She got a phone call. And, and I don't mean to generalize this woman, but we probably know the type, the one that's like, 
you know, would get pulled over by the cop and tell him he's got to wait. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, so she yeah. takes the phone call and she's like, yeah, oh, no, I'm in the White House. And I can't do this voice any justice. But the Secret Service agents looks at her and with lasers shooting out of his eyes, he says, ma'am, hang up the phone right now. He didn't raise his voice, but his tone of voice said, I'll crush your skull. That's the next oh, step. Right. In this yes. Right. And yes. she crumbled. She just like, I got to go quick, hung up, put it away. I'm sorry. And I looked at him and I went, teach me that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, no. I'm like, these powers must only be used for good, obviously. Right. Right. So, um, right. so yeah, there's none of that allowed. And the only way to get up to the upper floors, the Lincoln bedroom and so on, uh, of the building is by invitation of the first family. And, right. um, you know, I don't, I don't make campaign contributions north of zero, uh, when it comes to our presidents, uh, all parties, by the way, I just don't do it. I don't, I don't, sure. I don't think it's right. Um, so I don't, I, I'd rather keep my money. Um, but, uh, so you either have to make substantial <laughs> campaign contributions or befriend someone in the first family, right. I guess. And I've managed to do neither so far. So, um, you never know. You never know if I'm further do. in than we did. And so what'd you find out? What, what ghosts are there in the white house? Were you able to, how did you find out who might be there? Okay. So there's, there's an incredible amount of resources. The thing about the white house is that everything that takes place inside that building is documented and redocumented. And so, uh, I called every presidential library in our nation, and this is a resource available to all Americans. Just, I think a lot of people don't think, think about it who aren't research. And I said, I'm looking for every reference to ghosts in the White House. Uh, the Truman presidency had tons. President Truman wrote about them in letters to his wife uh, again and again. He talked about how there was one night he was alone sleeping in the White House and he heard someone walking around outside of his bedroom door. And he said, well, who the heck could that be? And he gets up and he sees no one in the hallway, goes downstairs, finds the Secret Service agent on duty that's guarding the stairway and says, what are you doing upstairs? And he's like, sir, we're not upstairs. We're, we're at our post. No one's been upstairs. And uh, and he's hearing people walking around. And he, he, he would say, like, to quote President Truman, sure is shooting. The place is haunted. Right. That's that's a direct quote from the president. Um, you know, various presidential libraries had references. One was even classified. I spoke to the George H.W. Bush Library, the elder Bush. And I said, I'm looking for for references. He said, I have two, but they're both classified. And would you like to file a Freedom of Information Act? And I said, well, yes, I would. And um, <laughs> so uh, I wrote my my book, you know, Who's Haunting the White House? And like six months later, after the book's out, I get a letter in the mail from the, the presidential library saying we have declassified one of the two documents. Oh. And I went, whoa, this is some stuff, right? Like, I'm ready. And I opened it up and it was a photocopy of a handwritten note from President George H.W. Bush to the uh, author, David McCullough. He writes those really thick, you know, history books, those yes. great books. And I'm paraphrasing the note, but it more or less said um, either the White House really is haunted or the thunderous applause after your speech last night is still reverberating around this building. Thank you for coming out to share your, your knowledge and your stories with us. And I was like, oh, this is a personal note between two people. I really had no business reading it, yeah. but it did sort of acknowledge that the White House has a haunted reputation and the president knew about it, Yes, um, which I thought was of note, right? It's interesting. Um, but man, oh man, every presidential library has references to the ghosts. Uh, Jimmy Carter's daughter used a Ouija board in the uh, Lincoln bedroom. Uh, Ronald Reagan once talked about how his little dog would bark wildly outside the Lincoln bedroom at nothing in particular and then run off. It was like an off the cuff remark. Um, so every president seems to be aware that this building has this reputation. And the earliest I found, the earliest story dates back to the Lincoln uh, presidency. So we're talking the 1860s and uh, Abraham Lincoln, his wife, Mary Todd, their young son, Willie Lincoln, died in the White House of a typhoid-like disease while, while they were in office. And it, it just crushed the family. And Mary Todd Lincoln wrote in a letter to her sister, uh, you know, he lives, Emily. He comes to me at night with his uh, uncle, Alec. Alec was uh, one of her brothers who died at a young age. So she's seeing, seeing the spirit of her son, Willie, and his uncle, Alec, her brother, uh, mm -hmm. coming to her at night. And she wrote about this in, in letters to her sister. Mary Todd Lincoln also held seances at the White House. Uh, and we know mm -hmm. President Lincoln attended at least one of them because he sort of paid a political price in the papers when they said, you know, what's this president doing 
bringing in these Looney Tunes psychics and mediums, right? So, um, so there's that. Now you could say Mary Todd Lincoln was a distraught mother who lost her child and was just dreaming the ghost. I understand that is a perfectly you know rational explanation. However, 40 years later, a military aide writes in his memoirs that uh, he was visiting the White House and the staff was telling him it's haunted by the ghost of a little boy. And the only little boy to die there was little Willie Lincoln. And that was 40 years earlier. So right. Mary Todd was long gone and so on. So these stories just persist. They come up again and again. Uh, yes, and, and, and people talk about it. Well, I think there's a lot more they know the people that live in that house and they share with us, uh, you know, we don't even have to get that, you know, the whole UFO thing is a whole other discussion we can have on another day, but I mean, sure. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of things where we're completely, uh, you know, we don't have the, the grade to see any of that information. So here's one of the things that I've learned, right? So a, a president and the first family will sort of talk about the ghostly stuff, but it has to be, once they're a good number of years out of office, right? Mm -hmm. Most presidents and first families really have to watch everything they say right. when they're in office because everything is under such scrutiny. Um, I mean, it, it seems like a terrible life. It's why I won't run for president. I'm here today to announce that I will not <laughs> take yeah. anyone's nomination. You're not throwing your hat into the ring. Nope, that no. hat's staying on my head uh, squarely. Okay. So um, it just seems like a brutal life. You're un you're in a fishbowl under scrutiny all the time. Everything you say, everything you eat, drink, or do um, can be you know interpreted. And so the families are careful. Once they're out of office and their political influence is really faded quite a bit they might get a little more loose lipped with, you know what, some weird stuff happened in there. But the staff, and there's a staff of about 100 people who work for the mm -hmm. White House. Uh, these are butlers, cleaning crew, groundskeepers, chefs, and so on. Um, they've been there for years and years. It, it's They're not politically appointed. So it doesn't matter which political party's in power. Um, you know, I, I met a, a third generation White House butler. Can you imagine that? His dad was a butler at the White House. His Amazing. dad's dad was a butler at the White House. Amazing. What what that guy knows. <laughs> you yes, know? exactly. And what the you know, Pat, again, storytellers yeah. is history. What has been passed down? What his grandfather probably told him while sitting around one day. And it it's just our entire history is without storytellers. Where would we be? So these folks are first of all they're incredible patriots, incredible historians, and they are they are devoutly apolitical because i had to ask a few questions i'm like yeah i, I said to to uh, gary walters i was like i'm gonna guess that you didn't vote for the person who won every time and you don't have to tell me which way you voted but you know there were democrats there were republicans i'm gonna go out on a limb and say the person you know you didn't vote for the winner and i said and even if you did like at some point that sob is going to do something so stupid and you still mm -hmm. have to bring him coffee Right. And you're going to be like, you, you, you flame it like a true New Englander, Jeff. Right. Like you, you, you idiot. Like, and yes. do, you, do you spit in it? Like, what do you do? And he's like, and, and I realized, so he said, no, we, I serve the presidency. And he made that very clear. And I went, yes, oh, yes. It's I the office, it. not the man. It's yeah. not. And, and so like the secret service would never, ever take a bullet for the president. They would take a bullet for the presidency. Yes. And and that's why they call the president POTUS, right? President of the United States. Like you don't even want to call him Barack or or Don or you know or and no. George or anybody, right? You want to just say like, nope, that's the presidency. I can't I can't watch the news. I can't know the kind of you know stupidity that some of these people say sometimes because I don't I don't need to hesitate when someone pulls a gun out, right? Uh, I don't need to go, well, would we be better off if I just sort yes. of hung back on this one? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so, um, so these folks are incredible patriots. And by the way, what was cool is like when I spoke to, to Gary Walters, he said, well, I was on duty one night and there was a, a DC police officer with me. And this strange wind came through and blew a door shut that was on a magnet. And well, I'll grant you, that is not the most profound paranormal experience you will ever hear. It is the White House. No doors are opened or closed without mm -hmm. pre-approval and check and double check. And he said it was the one, you know, they're on the big magnets that hold the doors, the fire right. doors. Right. 
And he said, we both felt the wind go by. We both saw the door close. We both looked at each other and thinking like, well, did someone open another door and create a vacuum or something? You know, you check that stuff out. It's the White House. No yes. one's supposed to be White coming House. in or going out, right? Unless we know right. about it. <laughs> and, and so, uh, and plus too, like, think about this. I'm going to guess that you folks know about as much about home security as maybe I do. Maybe you know more, right? But can you imagine the security at the White House? Like, oh. Pressure sensors on the grass, right. infrared cameras that can see like a bug crawling toward the building from a mile out, you know, like, right. so nobody's creeping on to that lawn without a hundred people knowing about it before you get within a hundred feet of the building. Right. And, and so, uh, so any weird thing that happens, they're like, whoa, this is the White House. And uh, one of the butlers was, was talking, I'm sorry, no, it was a foreman who said, you know, early one morning he was turning the lights on on the second floor. And that was part of his job. And he turned the lights on and there's President Lincoln sitting on a chair right outside of the Lincoln bedroom with his legs crossed, hands resting on his lap. And he looked right at him and then disappeared. And I went, whoa, I mean, Lincoln, we know what he looks like. He's on our money. Right. You right. know what I mean? There's, there's right. no, yeah. no mistaking who he saw. Nope. We right. know who he looks. And, and what what's so cool about these folks is they can talk about it, Right. They're yes. apolitical. It doesn't matter. Right. And they, you can't fire them. They're not going to get fired for that. You know, like they're, <laughs> they'd get fired for saying, oh, the president ate a hot dog last night. That you could get fired for because you're, you're talking out of school. You're, you're giving right. away stuff, but not what you experienced. And so I was so impressed that these folks are like, oh, I'll talk about me all day long. That's fine. You know, no problem. And I saw what I saw and I believe him. Now, let me go one step further. Uh, the presidents of the United States Truman, through all of them, are not drug tested. They are not psychologically evaluated in any way. They're not background checked. Uh, they just get in office and they can do all the crack in the world and they can be absolutely crazy. However, when the White House foreman tells you he went on the second floor and saw a ghost, that person has been background checked, psychologically evaluated, mm -hmm. drug tested, mm -hmm. eight ways to Sunday. Yes. I believe right. him before any president, right? Right. Like, that's the best witness we will ever find is one of the staff of the White House. They are vetted. They're not overtired. They're doing their job and they know the building inside and out. And I love that these stories continue to pour out of this storied building. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Now, you said last night that book is out of print, right? But they can get it on, as you say, on an audible? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, the book went out of print uh, a few years ago. It's too bad. Okay. It did pretty well. And then, uh, yeah. but it's on Audible. If you're an great. Audible fan, I narrate it. Um, we've got some voice yeah. actors and stuff, which is great, and nice. a few sound effects. So yeah, the whole book's on, on Audible right now. That sounds great. Anybody's looking for that, you can grab it. Uh, Who's haunting the White House by Jeff Bellinger. Um, so so you were also doing the New England Legends, which you have. We talked about on Amazon and also on uh, PBS. Any of the podcast that runs weekly. Um, what, are, what are a couple of your favorites? What are a couple of your favorite stories that you enjoy sharing? Oh my gosh! So the cool thing about New England Legends is it's become such a um, a crowdsourced uh, <laughs> program. Uh, what's neat is that our, our our listeners have been funneling in stories from all over the region. You know, so it's it's pretty cool now that that most of our leads come from our listeners because like, oh, in my town, there's this little haunted rock or whatever. I love the obscure things that um, you thought you knew uh, or mm -hmm. or or you didn't quite know so well. Like, like one that comes to mind is um, the Old North Church. Sorry to our British friends. I know this is a difficult story. Uh, <laughs> the Old North Church in uh, in Boston. Yeah. Uh, is where uh, Paul Revere, right? They, they famously hung the lanterns. Right. One if by land, two if by sea, the British are coming. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and so, uh, um, so, so anyway, that, that's, everyone sort of knows that story. We know, and when you go up there, it's, it's um, you know, when you go by the church, that's what everyone's there to see. However, on the side of the building is a plaque. And to me, this is the story that you don't know. There's a plaque that says, and I'm reading, I had to pull it up to read it. Don't think I have this memorized. Uh, 1757 to 1923. And it says here on September 13th, 1757. I'm going to say the year one more time so you know there's no mistaking. 1757. John Childs, who had given public notice of his intention to fly from the steeple of Dr. Cutler's church, 
performed it to the satisfaction of a great number of spectators. In 1923, the year of the first continuous flight across the continent, this tablet has been placed here by the Massachusetts Society of the Colonial Dames of America to commemorate the two events. Fly, 1757, he flew. And I can tell you, not only did he fly from the steeple of the church, the Old North Church, he did it twice. Not only did he do it twice, uh, it created such a problem that Boston literally banned the practice. You couldn't fly from steep church buildings or any other building in Boston anymore after this event. Now, balloon flight didn't come until the, the 1780s, and Kitty Hawk was the early 1900s. So 1757, someone flew twice what in was Boston? Going These are the stories I love. I love when stuff like that comes out. Now you're probably you, wondering how he yeah, did it. You piqued my interest. Do you know? I do know how he did it. It's a, I, I know the story. It's an awesome story. I couldn't leave you hanging. So uh, yeah. it turns out John Childs was a, a medieval type of rope flyer. And what they would do is they would tie ropes to the tops of tall buildings and tie it really tight down at an angle. They'd strap a piece of wood to their chest with a groove down the middle. They'd get on that rope and they would just <laughs> slide right down it. Dangerous, right? You lose your yeah. balance. You're a goner. Uh, so it's just like this medieval daredevil. And um, and so he was a rope flyer. Now, back then, nobody flew, right? There was nothing in the air. So a flyer was was that. Um, so, yeah, he created such a spectacle. It's, it's been banned. But the plaque doesn't say that. All you know is, is the plaque says he flew. <laughs> Fascinating. It, right? Yeah. And you love it. And I, and I think that this weird history that connects us to another time, um, you know, I can't get enough of it. Roadside oddity stories. People that, that put up some roadside oddity because they're like, you know, hey, uh, it's here. Like, let's just get noticed. Um, there was a guy in Vermont who built the Vermontosaurus. And it happened after his barn collapsed in a bad winter storm. And, and that summer, he just invited the public to come build a dinosaur out of all the broken wood. And the rule was you weren't allowed to remove anyone else's piece of wood and nothing could be plumb, couldn't be straight up and down or straight left and right. And so uh, so everybody just took the wood and they like all these people came and just started hammering it together until it formed this giant wooden dinosaur. I mean, like, you know, huge. And uh, I, just, I love people that do weird things that stick out and we remember them. You know, uh, it's the it's the stuff that makes our communities unique. The thing that you're like, oh, and he called it the Vermontosaurus because, of course, it's in Vermont. Um, just so many stories, so many great stories, ghosts, monsters, weirdness, you name it. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you've been involved with um, ghost adventures for. Since well, day one. Yeah, how long has that been? I was just trying to do the math. They've got a lot of seasons, but I'm not sure I could, if they follow by the year. How many? I mean, that's been a long time they've been on. 14 years. 14 you, years wow. we, we've do been doing this. Do you them on location, or are you mostly behind the scenes? I'm mostly behind the scenes. Um, that started in 2008, and I got a call from Zach Bagans, the host, and mm -hmm. they had just put out the documentary. Uh, and it was on the sci-fi channel and they'd use that as sort of like a pilot to get a series. And they said, Hey, we've got this eight episode deal with travel channel to, to do a show and they need help finding locations, finding the witnesses that share their stories, mm -hmm. sort of putting the history together. The stuff I'd done for years in books and on the web right. and magazines and stuff. And I was like, Oh, that'd be fun. I've never worked in TV. Let's do that. And so, uh, <laughs> so I did and it was great. And, um, the show starts to air and I'm like, well, you know, this is all it'll be. And the Travel Channel said, hey, we got a hit. How fast can you guys get back to work? Wow. And we've been pretty much going in production nonstop, except for COVID. COVID derailed us for a few months. Sure. Uh, but that's the only thing that got in the way of this, this speeding train. Um, it's been ever since. And it's just been an incredible ride to, you know, to, to work with those guys and, and, you know, be a part of this thing that... Uh, you know, gosh, everybody knows about now. So it's, it's yeah, crazy. Yeah. I've been on a few episodes, um, but for the most, but I've worked on all of them, um, you know, all of them for the history and so on. It's been, yeah, it's been a, an amazing adventure. So you find the locations. Uh, is that, is that your job and uh, to kind of scout them out? And, and it, it was in the beginning and, and now we've actually brought on another person that, that mostly does that, which, which is great because it's, it's an endless task. We're always, always looking for places uh, sometimes fans write in and, and we'll check those out too. Um, I, you know, I pass them along, but, but once the location has been determined, then it comes to me. And then I'm the one that's looking for like all the history that took place there. 
Um, I know some people, when investigators go into some buildings, there are folks that say, I don't want to know anything. And uh, I just want to see what I feel or whatever and, and so mm -hmm. on. That's fine. I am the polar equal opposite of that. 100% on the far, far other end of the spectrum. Yeah. I want to know everything because I don't consider myself psychic or sensitive, right? So I want to know what am I walking into? I want to know, wow, this is the room where this event happened. This is the place where, you know, this this history was made. And, and um, I, I'm not prone to see ghosts everywhere I look. It's happened to me, but it's, they've been few and far between. So I'm not too worried about, you know, tricking myself. It, it hardly right. ever happens. Um, so it's been, you know, it's, it's been a pretty, pretty crazy uh, adventure. So I like knowing all that stuff. And I'm the one that gives them all that information before they go in. So, you know, ghost adventures, you know, there's all the ghosts. I mean, it took off, right? So now we've got ghost hunters, we've got ghost adventures, we've got kindred spirits, we've got the whole list of them that are out there. And they're all different, right? They all have a different way of kind of going about it. And there's a certain amount of, at least in our world, you see ghost adventures as sort of like the hyperbole of ghost hunting, right? Jack is kind of like, you know, but how much of that? Is that is that really him? Is that him as a person? Or is that kind of like him as a showman when he's out? He's a passionate guy. And yeah. um, and he's not an actor, right? I mean, th this is like, you know, I have been on 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 the locations where like, once once those guys hit the ground, like Zach takes off, right? And he's like, I, this is what I want. I want to, you know, let's let's get the camera over here. We're going. And everybody races to keep up with him um, because that's the show. You know, you, you the thing is, especially when you're dealing with other people, uh, in my experience, there's been quite a bit of it at this point. You just can't stage much. Like if you're interviewing someone who's not used to being interviewed, I can't ask you to the same question four or five times. You're not going to answer it right. You know what I mean? So, for example, um, uh, let's just say you witnessed a car crash. Mm -hmm. And I come up to you and I say, okay, talk me through what you just saw. And you're like, okay, I saw this and the car came in and bang and boom. And then there was this, and the red car was over here and the blue car was over there. And wow. Okay. Um, the camera angle wasn't quite right. I need you to do that again. Any normal person who's not used to being on camera, which is 99.9% .9 sure. of the, the population mm -hmm. would go, okay. Well, I was in the intersection and one car came in and then hit the other car. And then the, the blue car was, I guess, was over there and the, the red was over there. I'm so sorry. There, there was a, a noise in the microphone. Can you do it again? So at the intersection, you know what I mean? Like you get a right. diminished return every time right. you absolutely right. have to be able to like <clears throat> go in and, and capture these moments as they happen. So the whole crew has got to be ready to move with Zach when he's interviewing people. And then once he goes in, those guys know what they're doing. They've been doing it a long time, you know, because they're mm -hmm. also the film crew. I've always thought this is one of the things I really like about Ghost Adventures, you know, on other ghost shows. And I don't mean to tell people how the sausage is made, but forgive me. Um, you know, you, you'll see someone. They're like, I'm up here in the attic. I'm really scared. By myself. I'm all alone. <laughs> right? Like, you're all alone. Who's holding the camera? Who's holding the camera? Right. 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 You got a, yes. a sound guy with a boom mic. You got a camera person. You probably have a producer up there. Like, you're not alone. Right. right. Like, like, our guys are filming themselves. They are alone. They really are. They're the camera. They really are. Yeah. So yeah. when Aaron's stuck in the, you know, they lock him in that room in the basement. Yeah. He's, he's alone in that room in the basement. Absolutely. And, and so, and, you know, and, and I'm not disparaging other shows, but I'm just saying okay. like, let's be real, you know? And, and so for example, ghost hunters, uh, ghost hunters, uh, this is a compliment. Sometimes the camera jerks and you see someone in the crew in the shot, mm -hmm. but they leave it because they're like, Hey, we heard something over there. Sorry, Charlie's holding the camera and in the shot over there, but Hey man, mm -hmm. this is what's going on. I respect right. that. That's cool, yes. right? You're, you're still trying to show things. that authenticity. Sure, um, sure. I, I think as a paranormal investigator, I watch each of these shows differently sure. for a different perspective. And when I watch Ghost Adventures, what I'm thinking is, this is your everyday guy off the street who happened to walk into, let's say he's a painter, and you're going to send him into this place to paint by himself. And then suddenly all this stuff is starting to happen to him. And he's kind of freaking out because he's not used to it. So I watch that that way, as opposed to watching Ghost Hunters, where we're professional paranormal investigators, and we come in and, oh, yeah, I heard that. That's wonderful. So there are different perspectives on how to watch these shows, I think. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, and I've known all these folks for you know, I've I've known Amy and I've know I've known you know uh, Jay and and Grant and everybody for like since the beginning. We've all known each other, you know, and and yeah. um, it, it's funny when people come up with like, oh, I'm sorry, I watch Ghost Hunters, not Ghost Adventures. I'm like, first of all, it's okay. There's no, and by the way, you're also allowed to watch both. Right. You know what I mean? Right, you can watch right. all of them. <laughs> it's all good. You know, there's no there's no competition really among among us. Like we all. And one of the questions that gets asked quite often is, are these shows good for the field of paranormal research or bad for the field of paranormal research? And I think the answer is as solid both. Right. Yes. Um, the good is that I mean, I think about when I, I when I was a kid, I grew up with Ed and Lorraine Warren. Right. The 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 conjuring movies, all that stuff's based yeah. on their work. I knew him when I was 13. They lived in the next town over from me. Every, they, Lorraine went to our church. We saw them in the grocery store. We'd see their library programs and so on. They're way more famous now than they ever were when I was, you know, they were regional celebrities when I was a kid. Right. So um, I was intrigued by that. Um, however, you know, so, so, so paranormal research back then, if you, you were, you were kooks, you were, you were crazy. And now because of the popularity of all the shows, ghosts are out of the closet. We can talk about it. You can be at the office and sit around your water cooler and be like, I think my house is haunted. Cool. I have a paranormal research team. Can we come in this weekend? It's yeah, fast. absolutely. Yes. Now, right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it's it's okay. So that is a very good thing because the discussion, the open discussion of any subject, I think is a, is a positive move forward um, in anything. However, it, th these shows do set expectations that if you go into a haunted building every seven minutes, something crazy is going to happen before we go to commercial. Right. And what you're watching, so, you know, you're watching a highlight reel with these things. You know, we got cameras everywhere, uh, all rolling for hours and hours, and it gets cut down to like, you know, 25 minutes of the show. And, and so you're watching the highlight. And sometimes the profound thing that happens, you don't even know what happened until days later when you review the evidence, when right. you're going through the recordings and you're going mm -hmm. through the video and you go, whoa, when we were there, we caught this. We just didn't know it at the time. And so you cut that in at the end because again it's it's a highlight. So um, so it does set some some expectations that are are not always realistic, um, but that's how it goes. These shows must entertain, otherwise people won't watch. Well, they'll turn it off. Yes, yeah. so I was on a home investigation in the Bridgewater Triangle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which was very cool. Um, and the uh, homeowner's daughter was in her late teens, eighteen or so, and she had asked if she could sit with us as we we're doing an investigation. So about maybe four or five hours into the investigation, she's just kind of sitting there, and I looked at her and I said, "It's not like the TV." shows is it and she said i'm so bored yeah. <laughs> that's so true yeah you know what? everyone's i've had people yell at me at like conferences like we should do a show of what a real paranormal investigation looks like i'm like yeah i'd watch that Hey, bro, it's your turn to get coffee. Oh, I got coffee right. last time. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yep, snack time, water <laughs> break, right. <laughs> right. Conjuring house a couple of weeks ago. So there you go. We were just upstairs and that was it. It was not you my fell asleep at the conjuring no, house. Yes. It was the same thing though, Julie. You know, we got back, we went through the evidence and oh my God, there's this thing in the mirror and there's this thing on the audio. And you know, you find all this stuff after the fact, yeah, you know? Sure. Jeff, I'm going to ask you to hold on one second. I have to take a quick break uh, for the sponsors, commercial break. I'll be back with you in just one minute. And we're back. We're talking with Jeff Bellinger today. We've been talking about Ghost Adventures and his experiences with Ghost Adventures. Jeff, have you been out to Zach's Museum? I've not been there yet. I haven't been to Vegas in a, in a few years, so uh, I've not. But, I, I mean, I did work on some of the episodes we filmed there. Um, yeah. And I helped him get some of his items. Every now and then, someone will... Really? You know, Something came across, and uh, yeah, David Koresh's car was one of those things where I was like, "Hey, man, Zach, some of this guy's looking to sell David Koresh's car." And like a couple hours later, he's like, "I just bought it." I'm like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> well, I, I was lucky enough to go last June. Oh and, yeah, what'd you um, yeah. I went out. I was I was there for another reason, but I said, you know, I've got to go to the museum while I'm there, and I stayed for the investigation at night. And um, it was quiet. You know, I mean, again, again, that's how it is, right? It's hit or miss. You think Zach Vegan's museum is, is going to be like his TV show, like? things popping out at you every five minutes, but you know, it's not like that. It was what it was, but it, it, his collection is just incredible. The collection of oddities is just unbelievable. So one of the things that's always been of interest to me is that uh, 
the, there's an idea, a concept called psychometry, right? The idea mm -hmm. that um, this, this goes back a long time. Like you could hold a ring and be like, I see a person with dark hair and blue eyes, you know, that you could pick up the energy of the person who owned that object. I understand and respect the fact that um, sometimes an object, uh, it carries an aura to it. You know what I mean? So, uh, for example, you know, we've, we've done some stuff in museums and there's some macabre things around, right? Like this was the murder weapon in this horrendous crime. And you're looking at this and you're like, whoa, someone's life ended at the end of that blade. You know, and there's there's a power to that. You connect, right? That's a human thing. If you want to call that psychic, that's fine. I accept that term. But to me, I think uh, it, empathy is a better word, right? So, sure. you, you know, you if you go to the Lizzie Borden house and you stand in front of the couch and you look down and you go, I mean, not that exact couch, but one just like it, right where you're standing, someone's man, some someone's head was crushed, right, by someone very angry. Someone died right where you're standing right. and you, you, you get the willies because you're a human being and you imagine what it must have been like to be taking a nap and suddenly there's an ax coming down into your head by someone you knew, right? I mean, that's, that doesn't take that. And uh, loved and yeah. should have loved you. <laughs> right, right. Theoretically, right? I mean, that's all, all that stuff. And so you start to imagine, you go to Gettysburg and you imagine what it must have been like. You got to take that hill and you're not going to take the hill. You're going to die. You know, as soon as you're forced to charge, you're going to get gunned down. And, and you, you imagine what that fear and, and that rage and all those horrible, scary emotions must have been like because you're a human being. Just like if you walked into an empty room and you saw someone sitting in the corner, just crying, sobbing, wouldn't you walk over and say, can I help you with something? Are you okay? Do you, right. do you need to talk? Is there something I can do? Because you're a decent human being. That's called yeah. empathy. Someone's in pain. You feel it. And I think we can feel that pain even across the ages. And sometimes these objects that, and they're all over Zach's museum, uh, connect us to events that are dark and scary. The darkest and scariest parts of the human experience, serial killers and murderers and all that other stuff. Yeah. And we connect. And it's that important. Was intense. That was an yeah. intense room. He's got all the stuff from the serial killers. And he's got Kevorkian's car, which, yeah. you know, I mean, you're standing there looking into the back of the van and it's like, wow, you know, you just, I'm getting goosebumps now just thinking about it. It's, it's just the things that happened there. Yep. You know? Oh, for sure. And funny did. story about Jack Kevorkian. Jack um, Kevorkian, yeah. I, I used to I used to list him as uh, for those who don't know, Jack Kevorkian was Doctor Death. He um, he was a big advocate of patients, uh, uh, doctor assisted suicide. So for people who were terminal with various illnesses, he felt that it was a, a dignity to to be able to go off on your own terms. Uh, I agree with him, hundred percent. By the way, um, that that people should have that option if they're facing terminal illness. Um, but the the U.S. legal system does not agree with him. Anyway, uh, I used to list him as my primary care physician all the time. <laughs> you are a very sick man, Jeff Bellinger. <laughs> like I'd go to my optometrist. Like when you go to your eye doctor, they don't really need to know. Like you're just getting your eyes checked. You know, like who's your primary care physician? I'm like, Dr. Kevorkian. And they're like, I've heard of him. Why? I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> is, is he over in the, the next town's office? I'm like, no, I don't I think he's a little further than that, but it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's just, it's fascinating. Uh, you know, we were talking, you mentioned last night, uh, just briefly about Tixbury hospital mm -hmm. and have you, have you been up this way? So Tixbury hospital, we are located in that area. We're in Tixbury. Um, there's going to be a brewery right where I'm sitting right now, which is the whole thing last night. I've got to move my studio because there's a, brewery coming right Scott, there's not going to be a brewery there's going to be a treehouse brewery it, it, yes that's which, by the way as breweries go i i apologies to every other brewery on earth i've not found one superior yeah. that's that's great though because the town can use that you know yeah. what i mean i think it's fantastic you know it's a beautiful spot um and we'll be fine it will look just like this you know with a green screen and a camera i can be anywhere right there it is i'm in peabody you know but the Tewksbury Cemetery, have you spent any time in there at all? Have you gone through? No. So I've spoken at the Tewksbury Library a number of times. And I've gone up early a couple of times and wandered the grounds of the hospital, which, of course, is right next door. And right. um, and, and the cemetery is related. That's that's the patients, right, that didn't have anyone to patients, claim. Patients, I think some staff members, too, may be in there. Right. Um, what's interesting about it is they bury them in the woods. So, you know, they call it the pines because it's just these tall pine trees. And 
you know, the ground is like this. There were no, there were no, you know, boxes or, or vaults or anything like that. Some of the graves are, you know, they're caved in. There's little markers and they're flipped over. And, you know, it's, it, you don't even know it's a cemetery when you drive by until you get in there. So Julie and I went in, we were walking the grounds and we got to the main gate As of the people cemetery. people tend to do, right? You know? <laughs> well, you know, but you do. There's walking trails in and around. There you know? there and there's is. what used to be, I think, back in the day, there's a granite post at this, you know, you can, you can enter in. And there were two trees. And on one tree, there was a little, um, like a pail. And it had Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Santa Claus. And then pinned to the other tree was a voodoo doll. Now, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, kind of, kind of spooked me. I'm not going to, not going to lie. You know, the mouth was sewn shut and the eyes and had the wedding dress and the whole bit. And it's here. We went back a year later and it was still there pinned to the tree. So I don't know what that's all about. What it's all about is everyone looking at it going, I'm not touching that. I'm not right, touching that. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Don't even yeah, want to. I'm not even that, touching but... Santa or Rudolph at this point. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Yeah. So there's some, there's some funny stuff uh, out there and you know, that hospital is still in operation. So I don't know, you can't really get in anywhere. They've got locked wards and, and drug rehab centers and that kind of thing. It's not like those abandoned ones, but um, you know, there's got to be all kinds of stuff going on in there. And I don't, I don't know. You've never, you obviously, you know, you've walked through, but there's, you've never done anything there. You've never had any investigations or anything related to the hospital. No, but I mean, I've been in enough of buildings like yeah. it, you know, and, and I'm not saying they're all the same. They're not, but I'm, but they're all the same. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, uh, har there's horribly tragic stories that take place in there. Always. Uh, in general, these hospitals hmm. took in the unwanted, right? These, yes. some, some folks at some point in time, like if you had someone with a, a mental disability in your family, it was seen as like a horrible embarrassment. They would be kept chained in your basement or put in jails uh, oh. as opposed to be seen by the public and, and inhuman, right? Inhuman treatment and then thrown in, into these buildings, discarded by their families. And then hopefully they had staff that took care of them and probably had, you know, felt some sort of uh, affection and good feelings for the first time in their lives. But when they got overcrowded and overtaxed and overstressed, it, it turns into hell holes and, and these buildings have got such stories to tell. And I think it's important to tell them, right? So from my perspective, we tell these stories, buildings sometimes are haunted because they should be haunted because we should be haunted by things that took place inside them because we should remember, you know, uh, Absolutely. it could happen again. It, we, we could, we could treat our, 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 you know, least of our people, those with mental disabilities or physical disabilities, we could treat them too poorly to the point where they're tortured. Uh, that's, that's someone's kid. That's someone's, you know, cousin, brother, yep. sister, and so on. Like that's, that, you know, another human I, we, being. we were on ghost adventures. We worked on an episode of, of um, in Spring Hill, Pennsylvania, the uh, Pennhurst asylum. Oh, and that's a place I've been in a couple of times for a few different projects. And my goodness, like that, that one is such a, a powerful location to me. I remember talking to one of the doctors, the, the travesties that took place there were in the 1970s, 1970s, right? Not ancient history. And uh, I, I, one of the doctors said something that chilled me to the bone. I get, still get chills when I think about it. And he said, as soon as you think of another group of people as something less than yourself, there's no limit to how badly you can treat them. And I was like, man, oh man, is that true across the board? It's true in politics. When you think, I was of like, just going to say, it's yeah. true. It's true today. It's is true it true today as it was back then? Yep. Exactly. If, as soon it as is. you start thinking like the, the other political party is less than me, right? Mm -hmm. There's no limit, right? There's no limit to what right. you can do. To, like, when you start thinking that way, it's a bad, bad line of thought. Uh, Absolutely. You know, uh, this group mm -hmm. of people, the people from this country are less than me. People of this religion are less than me. When you start thinking that way, uh, we're done. We're done. That's not society mm -hmm. anymore. That's not humanity. We're, we're, we're broken down. There's no hope at that point. And so let these stories be told. Let, let us be scared by the ghosts that roam these buildings um, and, and let them stay on our conscience. Because sometimes it, these, these haunts force us to look in the mirror and not always like what we see staring back at us. But right. that's okay. It gives you an opportunity to change. And, and do better tomorrow. Exactly. What you that that makes what you do, Jeff, as a historian, 
honestly so important because I mean it's you know the old adage those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it and it's frightening because you know it it most certainly can happen so it's just so important that we have people like you um, to pass on the stories, the folklore, and to back it up with the history. Yeah, well, thanks. And, and, and it's, uh, it's the subject I love. I can't imagine doing anything else at this point. It's, um, it's, it's uh, I agree. I agree. But I also think at the end of the day, there's just great stories, you know? Um, yes. And if you <laughs> want to take stories. them as just that, a good story becomes part of you. Uh, whether whether it's a movie you love to see or or you know something someone told you at a bus stop, right? It it becomes part of you and it changes you in some way. Even if even it's a teeny tiny little change or or maybe it's a bigger change, um, we change when we allow ourselves to change. When we allow new information, new stories to come in and relate to them. And um, and so to me, that's the that's the ultimate goal: keep sharing stories and and take what we will from them. So do you investigate the paranormal anymore? I mean, do you do that or do you just kind of do the the legends type thing, the folklore? Yeah, you know, it's when I started in all this, I had all the gear, everything, right? And um, like your friend who was sitting with you for hours in the dark, I was like, I'm bored out of my mind. And, uh, you know, <laughs> sitting all night with a, a EMF meter is just not my idea of a good time anymore. I've done it on occasion. And once in a while, mm -hmm. I'll go in. But for me, I'm like, look, a million things will set off an EMF meter. You know what I mean? But an apparition forming in front of you and, and people see it. Well, that's rare. Uh, that that's there's not a million things that cause that. Uh, so I still like going to these locations. I like going at night in the dark and, and all that other stuff. That's that's super cool to sure. me. But I'm just not the paranormal investigator you expect when you know, you're watching TV with all the gear and all that other stuff. I am the one that's going to dive into the history, know the building, talk to the witnesses find, you know, kind of the whole story. So yes, I'm an investigator, but not, not in the sense that of the people oh, yes. that are on camera, you know, gathering the, the evidence. So, so we have probably just a few minutes left and I really want to give you an opportunity to talk about how people can find you and get your books, hear your podcast. Your podcast is everywhere. It's, is it New England Legends just like the TV show? Yep. Yep, same name, New England Legends. Yeah, wherever you get your podcast, it's available. Um, so yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I'm online. I'm on social media. You can find me on Instagram and uh, and Facebook and Twitter, and um, and my website, which is my name, jeffbelanger.com. Uh, that's got all my upcoming programs, um, where I'll be, and those kind of things, and and the various TV shows I've worked on. I've worked on a lot of Shock Docs too for Discovery, oh, yeah. um, but that's been on camera. So that's been um, you know more right. more TV work and. Uh, and I just, I love this stuff and I love connecting with other searchers, you know, who, who are, you know, looking yeah. for these stories. So, so grateful to talk to you guys last night and, and today as well. Well, you know, it's funny. You talked, you mentioned um, earlier how you just called the switchboard and I just texted or email Facebook message, Jeff Bellinger. And I'm like, Hey, Julie, he reached out. Oh no, I sent you an email. That's what it was. I was like, he got back to me. Like, who knows? You know, you throw enough stuff against the wall. Somebody's going to say it. And we really do appreciate it. You know what I mean? Because we're just, you know, we're small town, but we're, we're, we enjoy what we do. And we love uh, talking with people who are doing, doing good stuff, you know? Thank you. No, I appreciate it. My, uh, my soon to be nine year old, I got a little tongue lashing this morning because um, I got to meet a famous person and he really wished he could have come with me. So, oh, who'd guy. you get to meet? <laughs> His this name Jeff is Jeff Guy. So, some Jeff Guy. He no, got yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I hear he's on I'm TV. I missed that. Yeah. Next <laughs> time I'll bring him, but you know, he was, he was kind of impressed. I said, well, I'm sure I was a lot more impressed than you were. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's, you know who's not impressed at all? My 15 year old. I bet. Care less. Although, what was cool, uh, we, we were filming a documentary at the Conjuring House once a few years ago. Yeah. And uh, I was like, do you want to go? And like the Conjuring movie, we loved it. We loved it as a horror movie. It is has nothing to do sure. with reality, but right. it's a, if you can forget that, it's a fun movie. And uh, she's like, oh my God, yes. So I told the producers, I'm like, look, I have childcare issues. I need to bring my kid. Total lie. I just wanted to bring her. And so uh, <laughs> she's cool. She hung out in the kitchen while we filmed and she was bored as she should be. But I'm like, make sure you use the bathroom before we go. And so she's taking selfies in there for her friends and stuff. And then uh, when we left, I'm like, did you use the bathroom? She's like, oh, yeah, I, I went at least twice in the hours we were there. I'm like, cool. Forevermore, you can tell your friends you peed in the Conjuring house.
right? <laughs> and there you go. And there yeah, you go. Right. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's getting to the point like he wants to go, but I don't think he's quite ready. You know, he's he's just he's going to be nine in two weeks. So he's not he's not. I I don't I don't think he has first of all the attention span to sit there through those quiet times. But I also think, uh, you know, sometimes we still have to leave the hall light on, so we're not quite there yet. <laughs> you know, oh, Scott, I think this is a missed opportunity. You got ghost bait. Take him. Put him out there in the middle of the room. Be like, you know, stuff him in a and see what happens, right? Just just go. Yeah. Yeah. So next time. But next time you have a, a something, I'll look on the thing. I'll bring him because he, he does like it. He's just not, you know. In fact, where we live, if you go out in the woods in the back, there's an old cemetery that belongs to the Tuxbury State Hospital. And we've gone out there at two in the afternoon, you know, and right. gotten EVPs and stuff. And he just thinks that's great. But yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think with our kids, you let them lead the way. You know what I mean? That's um, it. They'll ask. You don't want to force it on them. Uh, you know, it's like broccoli, right? If you force it on them as a kid, they'll never like it as an adult. So well, you, you let them lead the way. You know, they say uh, to a kid, you know, what's the difference between broccoli and boogers? Kids won't eat broccoli. You know, they'll eat <laughs> <laughs> So there it is. Jeff, Scott Allen, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, you're all week. <laughs> Jeff, it's been an absolute pleasure, really and truly. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, we enjoyed your program last night. If anybody gets a chance, go see Jeff Ballinger at one of his one of his programs in and around New England. Um, and thanks for today. Thanks for being here with us. This has been a, a quick hour, and I and I appreciate your coming on the show and chatting with us. Good luck with all you have going on, and I'm sure we'll see you somewhere around the circuit at some sounds, point. Sounds good. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much. You, have a great Jeff. rest have of the day. day. You too. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. You have been listening to The Paranormal Project with Scott Allen and Julie Finn. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. While you're there, leave us a rating and review so others can find out about the show. Stay haunted and go out there and explore the paranormal.